All right, so today for your online lesson, we're going to be taking a look at uh, what would we would have been talking about in class on uh, the block day, where we would have been talking about guidelines for FRQ writing for AP Psych uh, and starting to prepare for the upcoming FRQ practice on Monday, March the 2nd. So first I wanted to show you uh, the list of um, ideal uh, guidelines that were provided by Mr. Canterbury, who is our most senior AP Psych teacher at South. Uh, he's been teaching AP Psych for more than 20 years, as long as the course has been around, and actually works for the College Board as a consultant. So what he has to tell us about the FRQ is certainly very important. He's also been a reader for the AP exam since uh, the late 1990s, which means he goes to the conferences where teachers read uh, these FRQ responses from the AP exam. Uh, so what he tells us is very important and is, is very in, insightful, and we want to pay close attention to that. Uh, so the first thing that he tells us is, thou shalt not write an introductory paragraph or concluding paragraph or statements. It would be a waste of time. And that's just because on the AP exam, you're given a limited amount of time to answer two questions. Uh, this upcoming Monday on the practice in class, you will have uh, 30 minutes for one question. So you don't really need to introduce and conclude your writing because uh, that typically is redundant. Mr. Canterbury also says, thou shalt not be overly concerned with grammar, spelling, etc. It's not graded while well, psychological knowledge is. And that's, that's correct. It's not something for you to be worried about in the sense that you should be worried about spelling counting off in any way. That's not part of the scoring rubric. Uh, on the AP exam or for the upcoming practice. Uh, keep in mind, though, that it is important if your poor grammar, spelling, or such gets in the way of communicating whatever message it is that you're trying to convey in your writing. Third, uh, Canterbury says, thou shalt always write in sentence paragraph format. Listing, writing, and phrases, etc., will not help your cause. Again, there's no part of the score that goes in there, but uh, on the AP exam or next week. But if your message is not fully communicated because you've written in short phrases or you've listed or things like that, then that's not going to be helpful to conveying your message. Also, you have to realize that the people who score your AP exam, FRQ responses, um, as well as myself as a teacher who will score your in-class practices next week, um, even if we try not to, when we see a response that is written in phrases, that's listed rather than in complete sentences, uh, there are certain things that we might unfortunately assume about you as a student because you did not write in complete sentences. So you should write in complete sentences and in paragraphs. Thou shalt write in ink. That is a requirement of the AP exam. You must write in a pen on the AP exam FRQ. Um, and so what that also means then is that if you make a mistake, you can just cross it out. There's no white out. You don't have to scratch it out and make it so that nobody can read it. You put a line through it and it's accepted uh, by the readers that you don't want what's been crossed out to be read. Uh, thou shalt write legibly. Um, obviously, if, if you want someone to be able to read and understand the message you intend to convey, you need to write so that that person can read it. Uh, at the AP readings, teachers sit for hours upon hours grading, uh, reading and grading essays. And if a, a reader gets your essay at the end of the day, uh, it's going to be difficult for them to really focus and maybe give the kind of attention to your writing as maybe they should. Thou shalt not use the root word when asked to define a term within your definition. Um, so don't, don't use part of the word itself. For example, with repression, you wouldn't want to use the root repress to define it. Um, or for a cognitive psychology, you wouldn't want to use the word cognitive or the word psychology. Don't use roots are parts of the concepts to define them when you are defining them. Uh, when you underline, uh, when you write about the word, underline the word when you're defining it. You can use abbreviations in AP psych writing, 
but make sure that you establish first what the abbreviation is. So if you're writing about independent variables while you were writing, you would want to write the word independent variable and then put in parentheses right after it IV. And then from that point on, you could use the abbreviation IV to represent independent variable. Uh, if you if thou findest misinformation, Mr. Kinderberry says, leave it and add correct information at the bottom of your free response, uh, unless the misinformation is contradictory. Um, that is, if you realize you've put something that's incorrect, you can just add the correct information later. Now, the problem comes, though, if the incorrect information contradicts the correct information. If there's contradictory information, then you need to cross out the wrong information. Um, wrong information won't count against you unless it contradicts something that's required for you to get the point. If you're not sure, I would suggest crossing out whatever is wrong if you know that it's wrong. Uh, one kind of overarching kind of principle for AP psych writing is define and apply, define and apply, define and apply. You'll be presented with a question and then told to apply uh, a particular set of concepts to a scenario or to a circumstance that's posed by the question. And a principle that most readers will need to apply is to define each of the concepts that are listed and then apply it in the way that the question is uh, given to you. So, for example, if a specific FRQ prompt read, a mother posted a photograph of her bathroom vanity drawer on social media. The mother's son had left his toy gun in the drawer, and it sat in the drawer along with a variety of makeup containers and tools. The mother posted a caption with the photo, evidence that boys live here. Then the question, that's kind of the stem or the main part of the question, then it starts giving you instructions. Part one, you should discuss how each of the following concepts would relate to the scenario above. And then the first item listed might be gender role. And then in the context of an AP site question, FRQ, um, you would have a list of maybe four, maybe six terms to apply to the specific scenario in that FRQ question. Uh, so if this was a response that was presented by a student, uh, if we're thinking about define and apply, and they write, this picture would be an example of gender role because as a woman, the things in her vanity drawer should be things like makeup and other things women typically use. But having a toy gun in there is a bit odd. Toy guns are usually meant for boys to play with. Well, right now, as a reader of this response, I have no idea if this student knows what gender role means. Uh, the definition of gender role is an expected behavior for males or females. Um, and so because of that, it, it sounds like this writer is not really sure what a gender role is. They may know, but I can't tell just from reading this. And so this student would not receive the, the point because uh, if they did know what gender role is, they haven't clearly defined it, and really ha their application doesn't show that they know what it means either. Um, they haven't described a specific behavior. They've said women typically use those things or boys usually do this. It's meant for them, but they haven't shown that they know that the word gender role means uh, a societal uh, expectation of behaviors for boys or girls or for males or females or something like that. Uh, with this response, uh, if, a, if a student wrote, this picture relates to gender roles. Males usually play with toy guns, not older women. Uh, women. The toy gun is an expected behavior for young males. Women are expected to have all the stuff in the vanity drawer except the toy gun. Now note that this student did not give a really, really clear definition, but it's embedded in their answer. The toy gun is an expected behavior for males. Women are expected to have the stuff in the drawer except the toy gun. And they've even misspelled. Here's a good example of, um, uh, I'm sorry, no, they didn't misspell it. Except is spelled correctly. Uh, E-X-E-P-T is the correct spelling for that form of except. 
Um, and so this student would receive the point because their writing clearly establishes that they know what the word gender role means and how it applies in the situation. Now, uh, this person did not follow specific guidelines of underlining the words and things like that. I'll show you an example that follows all of those guidelines in just a second. Uh, here's another student, a very a short response from a student. I believe this is an example of gender role. A male child playing with a toy gun is expected behavior from a boy. Now, I think that if this were an actual FRQ, and this was one part of that FRQ, this response would receive the point because uh, the definition for gender role is embedded in this person's application, expected behavior from a boy. I can reasonably assume that this person who wrote this knows what gender role is and has applied it to the situation. Now, I would argue that this person's answer would be even better and almost definitely would receive the point if it were an actual FRQ being scored by an actual AP reader if this student also included the definition for gender role. Uh, gender roles are an expected behavior, uh, are expected behaviors for boys or girls. I believe in this example we have a gender role because a male child playing with a toy gun is expected behavior from a boy. For sure that gets the point, but even written as is here, I think it would score the point. Uh, and here's a, a, a final example of a response that would definitely receive the point and is following some of those very specific guidelines that Mr. Canterbury offers to us. Gender roles, you see the word is underlined when it's being defined, where it's being first written about, are the expected behaviors for males and or females. In the scenario, and so there's even a cue here in the writing that the person who's writing this is about to apply. Uh, in the scenario, the mother expresses a gender role. Boys play with toy guns. She also suggests in her caption that makeup use is an expected behavior for females. And so this response is particularly strong because it has the definition. And then in the application, the person has included words that are from uh, the definition. Boys play with toy guns. Um, the, she suggests in her caption, the makeup is an expected behavior for females. There's the uh, expected behaviors definition in the application part. And so this person would definitely get the point if uh, it was being scored as an actual FRQ response. Get the point for this specific part of an FRQ. Uh, finally, I want to share with you uh, an acronym, a memory tool that will help you remember what I think are uh, five of the most specific, important things that I'd like you to remember for writing for the AP exam. Uh, and for our practices, we'll have two more practices this year, uh, this coming Monday, and sometime very close to the AP exam. Um, and there's, there's five specific things that we're going to use the word soups, okay? A letter S stands for sentences. You need to write your FRQ response in complete sentences. Again, as I mentioned earlier, that's because if you're writing complete sentences, uh, it makes not only your writing easier to understand, but it also makes uh, the person who is scoring your FRQ response uh, feel a little bit better about your writing in general because they can see you are capable of writing in complete sentences. The O stands for order. Answer each part of the FRQ in the order that the prompt lists the parts. Now, the uh, AP exam scoring guidelines don't require for you to get points that you answer them in order. But here's the thing, a person scoring your response is going to have a lot easier time finding your answer, knowing what you're writing about, if you answer it in the order that it's listed. Um, and the less work you can make the reader do to try to find your answer, uh, the better off you'll be. Um, now, if you get to the AP exam or in practice in class and you uh, skip an item and then later in the writing process realize you, you, you have an insight learning moment and you remember something you learned, from earlier in the year and you can write the response. It's okay to add that to the end of that question's response. Yeah, you, you don't have to try to insert it in or draw lines and fit it in. Um, that will never count against you. But if you can write in the order that the question presents the concepts, that's probably in your best interest. U stands for underline. 
underline each concept or term the first time you use it, which should be when you're defining it in your writing. Um, again, this is a cue to the writer that says, here is where I'm going to talk about this term, and, and uh, it's become sort of a custom uh, that students underline the word the first time they're writing about it in their response. And so readers who have been to the AP Psych reading year after year after year will feel comforted by you doing that, by you underlining the word. Uh, write in pen, okay? You must write in pen. Well, you'll have to write in pen in class for these summative practices that we have. Uh, again, Monday, March 2nd, and one closer to the AP exam in April, late April. You need to write in pen. You must write in pen on the AP exam. You're going to have to write in class on these summatives uh, in pen. And then finally, separate. Uh, keep your response to each of the F FRQ parts separate using a separate paragraph for each part's response. Now, the reality is your response to each part might, in some cases, if you're a really good writer, might just be a really long, complex sentence or a couple of short sentences. Uh, where you define and apply, maybe two sentences to do that. But separate them in paragraph format, again, because it makes uh, the reader's work, the grader's work, easier uh, in that they can visually see where one part of your response starts uh, and ends and where the next part starts and ends. Uh, so these, if you'll remember soups, think about soup and think about uh, these five things. You might even kind of repeat to yourself a sing-songy version of this. Sentences, order, underline, pen, and separate. Sentences, order, underline, pen, and separate. In order to kind of keep yourself focused on what you need to be thinking about when you're formulating your answer to the FRQ. All right, I want to go back real quickly and look at uh, this response and talk about the things that uh, it, it does following soups. Sentences, you'll notice there are uh, two complete sentences here, all right? Order, all right, now this is an example. We assume this is the first uh, part of a, a larger FRQ question, and all we did was answer the first part, and it's answered first, okay? Underline, the word gender roles was the site concept. It's been underlined, okay? Sentences order, underline pen. It, you may not be able to see it because it's on a computer screen, but it has been written in a black ink pen. Sentences order, underline pen, and separate. Notice that gender rules has been indented here and that this is the end of the writing. If there were another item, this writer would indent again here and write the next part uh, so that the parts were separate. All right, so sentences order, underline pen, and separate. 